so good to virtually see everyone. My name is Amy Layton. I'm the Director of Higher Education here at New America, and I'm really excited about uh, today's event, which is our fourth annual Varying Degrees event. And it's been really interesting to see how public opinion has and hasn't changed over the last few years. So um, I just want to walk you quickly through what we're going to be doing today on our agenda slide. So. Uh, what we're going to do today is we are going to um, go through our findings of varying degrees this last uh, round that we've done and some key findings. And this is always a favorite for me because it's interesting to see as a sort of higher ed policy person to see where, um, you know, where the things that I think sort of uh, are the same as those in the general public and where they're different. And I think that that's pretty interesting for most of the audiences generally. And we're going to have a little interactive thing. So those of you who have been in our live event um, know that we have some uh, polling. We're going to have that as well this time. And then after that, we are going to have a panel discussion on love in the time of cholera, or basically a higher ed polling during the uh, COVID crisis. And what on earth does public opinion mean, given that so much is happening and so much is shifting? And then after that, we'll go to Q&A, which uh, Angela said at the top that we are, uh, get, it's gonna be conducted through the chat. So make sure to put your questions in there. And if you are tweeting, uh, use the hashtag varying degrees. And um, with that, I'm gonna kick it over to our deputy director for research, Rachel Fishman, who's been leading this effort this year and for the past four years. Rachel, take it away. Um, so today, like Amy says, and thank you, Amy, for that great introduction, um, I'm going to be talking along with my co colleague and co-author, Sophie Nguyen, about, um, about the findings for Varying Degree 2020. Our major thing that we want to talk about this year is that the data reflects sentiments pre-COVID-19. So we fielded this survey at the very end of what I'd like to call the before times. February 11th through the 24th, 2020. So this is really when we saw in, um, in you know, we started hearing in Washington state about an outbreak. Um, things by the end of that period were starting to get bad in New York, but importantly, no state had shut down really. Um, no higher education institutions had shuttered. So this is a snapshot in time right before the pandemic hit. But this data is going to provide an important baseline to help measure how perceptions change over the course of the public health and economic crisis, especially as the dust settles from the public health crisis over the next year or two, um, it's going to leave a large economic crisis in its wake. And, and so we're hoping that this data is going to help inform policy decisions over time as we see how people's feelings about higher education change over time. But what's really important is that even um, before the pandemic, uh, the value of higher education from Americans is still seen as very strong. Um, where they have concerns is over cost, access, and affordability. Uh, and, and at the end of the day, they want any funding increase to be held accountable. A little bit of nitty gritty about the sample. There were, uh, this is a nationally representative survey of 1,500 U.S. adults ages 18 and over. Uh, it, uh, NORC at the University of Chicago fielded the survey using the AmeriSpeaks panel, which is predominantly online, but also has a telephone mix. Our margin of error was plus or minus three and about a half percent. And we did uh, over samples of African Americans, Latinos, and Asian Americans. So if we go to the next slide. Um, I'm going to present what Americans believe about higher ed in 2020. So on the next slide, we're going to first talk about how it creates opportunity. Americans believe in the value of higher ed. Approximately four out of five believe it brings more job opportunities. Nearly 80% believe it offers a good return on investment. Um, and uh, a staggering 92% say it creates upward mobility. I mean, these are public opinion numbers you rarely see. Americans are really positive about the value of higher education. When we asked how people would feel recommending various levels of education to a close friend or family member, very few, only 17% would feel comfortable saying to their child or a close family member, you know what, um, just stop with uh, a high school diploma and don't pursue anything after that. 
On the next slide, the good news is that this is where Democrats and Republicans agree. Um, and bipartisan agreement, we are constantly hearing there's, you know, that Democrats and Republicans are very far apart, but on higher education, creating upward economic mobility and increasing job opportunities, they are really aligned. I'm going to turn it over to Sophie, who's going to talk about the next battery of questions about cost. Thank you, Rachel. Um, yes, um, so I'm Sophie. Um, thank you, Rachel, for sharing with us all the good news about higher ed. And then it's my turn to bring you some of the so not good news. So as much as um, Americans feel uh, that they really still that still feel that they can believe in the value of higher ed, uh, they still see a lot of problem uh, with um, the system as it is right now. Only one in three Americans think that higher ed is by the way it is and when we ask the reason why the answer is that way the most common response we got was that it's expensive. Only half of Americans think that uh, people can get high quality edu higher education that is also affordable and when we ask them uh, some a few questions about funding they 63 percent of them think that um, the government should be responsible for funding higher ed because it is good for society. Um, only 35% think that um, the students and families should be uh, the primary funding source because um, they personally benefit. And in the next slide, you will see that the funding issue is where Democrat and Republican greatly disagree on. 87% of Democrats think that the government should be the primary funder of higher education because it's good for society versus only 37% of Republicans feel, feel this way. And most, most Republicans, a majority of them, 60% of them to be exact, think that the student family should be responsible for funding it because it's their personal benefit. And in this next slide, you see that when we ask these questions in a way that then who should fund, uh, who should be the largest sort of funding for uh, low income students and low income students here we define uh, those students with family income of less than $45,000. Um, a majority, so most Americans do think that the largest funding source for low income students should be federal funds, 30% of 37% of them think that way. But at the same time, um, a significant 21%, which is one in five Americans, think that the student family should uh, shoulder the cost, uh, shoulder most of the cost by borrowing. And in the next slide, you will see that this is where um, we see a huge disalignment between Democrat and Republican. 49% of Democrats, so half of them, think that the largest funding source for um, low-income students should be should come from federal funds versus only 23% of Republicans think that way. And 35% of Republicans, so um, a third of them think that the student, and, the student and their family should shoulder that cost by borrowing. Um, but regardless, if you go to the next slide, you will see that a majority of of Americans, um, including Democrat and Republican, want to see more government funding into higher education to make it more affordable. So in particular, more than 80% of American adults think that state and the federal government should uh, spend more taxpayer dollars um, into higher education to make it more affordable. Um, Democrat, more than 90% of them think that way. And 72% and 65% of Republicans think that state and federal government should spend more to make higher ed affordable. Even though you can, you can still see a gap between Democrat and Republican, 72 and 65% is still a majority of Republicans think that way. Um, so I would uh, move to the next slide and switch it to Rachel so that she can talk about accountability issues. So like Sophie said, Americans want funding increase, um, but they also want that investment to be held accountable. On the next slide, Americans 
believe that colleges and universities should be held accountable for their educational outcomes. Um, in fact, nine out of 10 believe that colleges and universities need to be transparent about quality indicators such as graduation rates and employment outcomes. On the next slide, we see that most Americans believe institutions should lose some access to taxpayer money if they leave students with bad outcomes. In that regard, the outcomes that rose to the top when institutions should lose taxpayer dollars were low graduation rates, low rates of grads earning a living wage, and high rates of earning less than the average high school graduate. But still resonating with many people were uh, low rates of grads paying down their student loans, so student loan repayment rates, and high default rates for student loan repayment. I am going to turn it over to Sophie to talk about one of our very favorite sections that we run every year called Perceptions versus Reality. Yes, um, thank you, Rachel. This is um, one of our favorite sections in the more than 50 questions we ask in our surveys. And in these questions, we ask uh, people about um, to ask to have some of their guesses about some of the facts um, about higher education issues. And uh, we then compare those answers with um, the, the data that we, we have. I just want to create some activities for you today rather than like you just listening to us speaking by um, asking you some of the questions we ask people in our surveys. And um, if you go to the next slide, would you will be able to see the first questions so our first question, um, our first questions for you today is what is the total percentage of US adults who ages 18 and above that has student debt and you able to see um, the questions on your, on your screen and the options for you to choose it, uh, to choose from and um, I give you like 10 seconds sorry it's not a long time but hopefully enough time for you to submit your answers you ready I guess it's five four three two one yeah so uh can we see the responses from our audience please so i'm not sure if i can i'm able to see your responses uh but here is the responses from um the respondent about survey so nearly half of the respondents um in our surveys think that um okay i'm able to see your response right now so 35% of you think that um, the percentage of the U of, um, U.S. adult uh, that have student loan debt is between 50 and 80%. 80, 80, 38% of you think that it's between 30 and 50%. And 20% of you think that it's less than 30%. It's actually very close to what um, Americans respond, responded to our survey. So uh, most of them, 46% of them think that it's between 50 and 80%. And 30% of them think that it's between 30 and 50%. And um, only 16% think that it's less than 30%. And in the next slide, you will see that um, in reality, according to a survey conducted by the Federal Reserve Board in 2018, 16% of American adults have student loan debt for their all educations. Um, and if we also take into account um, the educations of their spouse, um, their children or grandchildren, the percentage become 21%. So yes, you we will see an overestimation there. Um, in the next questions, so in the next slides, please. Recent college graduate with a bachelor's degree who took out student loan, what do you estimate is the average debt upon graduation? So um, I also have five options for you to choose some. And again, you have 10 seconds to do so. So I give you five more seconds. So can I see the responses from the audience now? So um, let's see. So more than half of you think that it's between ten and thirty thousand dollars. A third of you think that it's between thirty and fifty thousand dollars. Only five percent of you think that it's ten thousand dollars or less. Um, only eight percent think that it's between fifty and hundred thousand dollars, and no one think that it's more than a hundred thousand um, dollars. Can we go to the next slide to see the responses from um, the respondent of the survey? So. In our surveys, um, most of our respondents, so nearly, 
nearly 50% of them think that the average student debt is between 50 and a hundred thousand dollars. 29% of, of them think that it's between 30 and 50 thousand dollars. Only 1% think, think that it's ten thousand dollars or less. And astonishingly, 8% of them think that the average debt for someone which is a bachelor degree is a hundred thousand dollars or more. In reality, um, according to our surveys conducted by um, the, according to a survey conducted by the Institute uh, for College Access and Success, the average student debt for someone who just graduates from a private or a private nonprofit, a public institution in 2018 is just nearly $30,000. Um, so that's all the questions I have for you today. Um, and I would like to switch it back to Rachel. Thank you, everyone, for bearing with us and for taking part in those live polls. Uh, it's really exciting to see people answer things live time and know that there are people uh, actually working with us right now. We're going to transition now to our panel discussion. Um, and so, again, I just want to reiterate that this is just a really brief overview. The survey actually was clocking in at 20 minutes for the, for the interviewee, so there is a ton of data a rich amount of data to go over but beyond the points that Sophie and I highlighted. Um, we have uh, the uh, data tool on our website so you can look at all the cross paths by demographics. Just be sure to go to varyingdegrees.org. Um, if you type any questions to Sophie and I about the data, we're going to answer them during the Q&A portion at the end of the panel. So we are taking those, but we want to give as much time to the panel as possible. Um, and I'm going to introduce our moderator, who's Eric Hoover, senior writer for the Chronicle of Higher Ed, and our panelists are John, uh, sorry, Jill Dunlap, uh, Director for Research Policy and Civic Engagement at the National Association of Student Personnel Administrators, Ken Redd, Director, Research and Policy Analysis at the National Association of College and University Business Officers, David Strauss, who's principal at Art and Science Group, and Christine Wolf Eisenberg, who's manager of surveys and research at Ithaca SNR. So, with that, Eric, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Rachel. Uh, hello, everyone. Greetings from Washington, D.C., here on Capitol Hill. Um, thank you for joining us today. Um, talk about surveys and polling. Um, if you can remember, back to uh, late March, I know it seems like years ago at least, right? But in late March, I was sitting around one day and I was looking at my inbox and my inbox was blowing up with messages and I feel like maybe half of them uh, were uh, touting the results of surveys and polling data, small survey responses, large uh, sets of survey data, um, trying to make sense of a world that had been turned upside down, right? And I, um, I've always gotten a lot of these um, uh, news releases about surveys, right, and polling data um, as a reporter covering higher ed. But all of a sudden, I felt like I was getting three or four or five times as many as before. And it kind of made sense, right? Uh, people were trying to make sense of an uncertain world um, and figure out what, what was going to happen next, right? Um, so I decided uh, to write an article um, that I was just re reading. It was, uh, it was called, for better or worse, it was called uh, COVID-19 the crisis that launched a thousand surveys. Um, and in this article, I uh, asked uh, people in higher ed, particularly in admissions and enrollment uh, offices, what they made of um, this flurry, this avalanche of surveys that we're seeing um, even in, in mid to late March. Um, and uh, uh, some people responded uh, very uh, cynically, skeptically. One told me, oh my gosh, I, I don't have time to possibly read them all. I read the first couple and they confirmed what I suspected. I'm really not sure of the value they're adding. Someone else said surveys taken today would likely be moot within 30 days or even 10 days from now because the world is changing so quickly. But I also got some other kinds of emails, very different responses from other readers, including one, uh, a college president who said, Mr. Hoover, I think you are a big jerk. Um, I depend on these surveys. I've never faced so much uncertainty in my 33 years as a college president. And anyone who's given me any bit of advice, any kind of survey data, 
uh, I want to salute right now because they're doing important work. I'm very disappointed in the Chronicle, in my story. Um, so I mentioned those reactions just to say they all add up to something. And I think that is that um, uh, survey findings, like we're kind of drawn to them. Uh, people tend to have, uh, especially perhaps right now, strong feelings about them. But they're important, right? Because uh, even if some surveys uh, are more helpful than others, um, people are trying to understand what's going to happen um, next week, what's going to happen throughout the summer, and especially when it comes to higher ed, what is the fall going to look like, right? Well, the answer is going to vary from state to state, campus to campus, region to region. Um, but uh, we can learn a lot from surveys, right? And we should think hard about like how best to use um, survey findings uh, to plan for the future, to guide our actions, right? As people who uh, work at colleges and universities, especially right now, are trying to um, do their best to adjust to a world that seems to be changing any minute. So I'll stop rambling and uh, ask you to think about the mindset of a 17-year-old, an 18-year-old um, high school senior just graduated. Nothing has really gone as planned as you were expecting. Uh, you probably didn't have an actual graduation. You had a virtual one. You had maybe no prom at all. And now you're thinking, wait, am I really going to be able to walk onto a campus as a first year student um, and actually stroll around um, and, 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 and uh, like I always expected? Um, people wanna know for good reason, what are prospective students, incoming first year students especially, thinking? Um, how is COVID-19 pandemic and all the economic uncertainty in the country, how has that affected their plans, their thinking about college, right? Um, and so this enrollment, uh, flurry of enrollment surveys we've seen have tried to give us a sense of that. And I can think of no better expert to talk to us about uh, what enrollment related survey data is telling us right now about what students are thinking and what they might be uh, doing this fall. So I'll turn it over to David who can tell us about um, what he's finding. Thank you, Eric. I, it's hard, of course, it's a, it's a dissertation to talk about what any of us has been finding in such arenas, but I'll try to be, uh, to hit the top of the, the iceberg, the tip of the iceberg. One, what, what my colleagues and I do uh, falls into three categories. We use uh, the research methodologies we've developed and the uh, predictive modeling technologies we've, uh, the techniques we've developed over the years to inform our consulting on institutional strategy, what an institution is trying to become and how it relates that to a constituency. We have for the last 25 years also done work in, uh, in a vehicle we call student poll, which are national surveys of college bound uh, high school students looking at what's going on in their heads. Uh, we also sometimes do parents and other things like that. And then the third is over the course of this crisis over the last uh, three or four months, we have fielded a lot of research for individual institutions again about what's going on in their constituencies very specifically uh, around the COVID-19 pandemic and its implications for who's going to come to school in the fall anew and who's going to come back and who's not going to come back as returning students in different scenarios of what might happen on college campuses in the fall. And the first thing we find is the, one of the points that you emphasized, Eric, that there are national data, there are national means, and there are national medians, and absolutely none of them predicts what's going to happen to an individual institution. They are appropriate for context, and they're appropriate for policymaking but they're not appropriate for individual institutions in figuring out what's happening to them and what they should do. These things vary by market, they vary by competitive set, they vary by the, the nature of the institution itself individually. What we've seen broadly then would be a couple of different phenomena. One is, as we've looked at students at different stages of their decision-making, even during this crisis, is that there's a threatening of a great deal of disruption from this crisis that still may not be over, by the way, even though May 1's passed and June 1 is passed. We found uh, in, a, in, in, a, in a representative national survey of high school seniors college bound uh, in uh, the end of March, something very, very similar, statistically unchanged when we looked just before May 1, the last few days in April, that one out of six students who had seen him or her or themselves 
as bound to be a full-time college student at a four-year institution, one out of six of them were saying they didn't think they were going to be able to do that anymore because of COVID. We saw another two-thirds of them saying they were concerned at one level or another that they might not be able to attend the place they intended to attend. And what we observed then was that these phenomena played out in all kinds of different things. Who was depositing? Who wasn't yet depositing? Who um, believed that once depositing, they were going to end up where they thought they were going to end up? All those kinds of things were up in the air, and especially up in the air, and it shouldn't surprise any of us, uh, for members of underserved populations in our country. The inequities in our country are only exacerbated by what's been going on over the last three months. And that is evident not only in healthcare and not only in, econ in economic affairs, it is actually traceable directly also to what happens to students deciding where they're gonna go to school. And what we've seen among studies for individual institutions looking at returning students and, and uh, individual students who might end up matriculating and showing up in, in August and September, we see it's very similar phenomena, but highly variable. We see institutions that can change their calendars a little bit and make sure they do online really well and help out students uh, with a couple thousand bucks to help them through this crisis. And they'll be fine. And we found other institutions that can throw 10,000, 15,000, 20,000, $25,000 at their students and still not be able to get them to come back to an online or largely online uh, uh, experience. So there's an immense amount of volatility. There's an immense amount of difference between the experience of one institution and another in this crisis. The common elements, Young people tend to be optimistic. They want to have what they've dreamed of having or dreamed of coming back to uh, over the course of this crisis when it comes to an on-campus classic experience among those who were anticipating that. Uh, they tend to be optimistic, um, but they tend to uh, predict that they will punish the institutions that don't give them what they want. They don't want to pay anywhere near as much. And don't forget, uh, one of the data points that we've seen in our surveys of students nationally is fully half of them tell us that they have lost, they have a parent who's lost a job or lost income during this crisis. Among college bound students, 52%. Pretty serious stuff going on. Thank you, uh, David. Um, for sure, serious stuff going on, and that's affecting um, the thinking, the mindsets, the planning of. Um, students who haven't yet um, reached college, right, who are on their way, uh, um, they, they hope, uh, they thought as first time, first year students. Um, but those same circumstances have also affected students who are already enrolled. And um, of course, in colleges um, have been leaning on institutional surveying and also some national surveying to uh, get a sense of what their uh, students who are already uh, part of the campus and part of their community, uh, what they needed, uh, what they're experiencing, what they're going through um, uh, as a result of this pandemic and all the disruption that, that um, followed. Um, um, trying to figure out how can we, what can we know about our students and how can we help them. Christine, uh, could you tell us um, what uh, some of the most meaningful um, themes or findings have been when it comes to uh, surveying uh, and polling uh, students who are already enrolled on college campuses? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Eric. I, um, I guess I'll just start out with a, with a little bit of context. So at Ithaca SNR, we're a, we're a research and advisory nonprofit. And uh, we very, very quickly adapted some of our survey instruments to roll out um, a COVID-19 student survey and a COVID-19 faculty survey focusing on research, teaching, and learning activities. Um, the first kind of meta theme that I want to draw out that isn't actually about the, the findings, but more about the, the process of getting these surveys into the field, um, and this, this might go against what uh, those who are attending here might might expect. It certainly went against what I expected. Um, we saw that response rates tended to really be up in our surveys across a number of audiences. So I think when you when you give people a meaningful chance to weigh in, when you show them that their responses will be acted on, when you make it really easy for them to, to participate, um, we saw both for our student surveys and our, and our faculty surveys that response rates were were up compared to what we what we normally see not during a pandemic. Um, 
but as far as what we've what we've seen in the the student survey results and we we actually coincidentally tomorrow we have a a big report coming out um, from results across the surveys that we've fielded across a couple dozen dozen institutions of their of their students um, as as some of what David was was alluding to before many of the challenges that students were facing um, before the pandemic are the ones that they're they're now facing especially for certain groups that maybe I'll speak to a little bit a little bit later um, plus they have a whole set of new challenges um, adjusting to online learning um, and, and finding adequate space to do to do work I mean I, I think about uh, my own home setup I can I can only imagine what this looks like for for a lot of students that have um, have fewer resources or have have gone home to a place where they didn't expect to be uh, to be working and um, taking taking classes at this at this point in time it also makes me makes me the the other big theme that's come out and I'll say that this has come out pretty clearly across uh, two-year institutions four-year institutions um, students are really missing a sense of connection to to one another um, they aren't just going to college uh, especially in a, in a residential sense when they're actually going away and, and living at school just to to learn they're looking for um, a social experience with other students with their with their um, instructors and there there obviously was a lot of focus for for good reason no criticism intended on instructional continuity during during the spring um, but there are all of these things that happen of course outside of the classroom uh, under normal circumstances that enhance the experience of of being a student so we're we're seeing that pretty clearly across the the schools that we've been working with thank you christine so yeah i'm thinking about all that was lost right not just uh, the ability to sit in a classroom and talk with your professor and ask that one extra question on your way out the door but but exactly that that sense of connection that it's intangible perhaps but so crucial to the college experience and jill i'm going to turn to you i'm thinking about the vast vast umbrella um of NASPA, right, of, of the vast uh, world of services and programming uh, that student affairs professionals um, are, are involved in um, every day, right, or at least, at least they were under uh, normal circumstances. Um, and I'm also thinking of the vastness of the institutions that you're in touch with, that your organization represents, right, colleges large and small and all different kinds. Um, I wonder uh, what you might tell us about what um, uh, is, uh, folks at institutions that you're in touch with were seeing, hearing, thinking about that loss of connection among students or anything else that was on the minds of students going through crisis over the last few months? Absolutely. Um, well, and we get at a lot of the needs of students through um, surveys of our professional members who are, you know, in a vast array of student supportive positions on campuses, as you mentioned, Eric. Um, I think, you know, I'm going to sound like a broken record here, but I will echo what David and Christine said that what we're finding um, from our members when we survey them is that students who were already in precarious positions or at risk or at promise, depending on the terminology you use, um, those who were working adults or working to support families, um, caring for parents or children or first generation, um, who were, you know, potentially in those precarious positions before in terms of their continued enrollment at an institution are you know, continuing to um, face those problems, but their problems um, have been exacerbated. And so um, we think about things like um, that, well, we find that things that weren't working before are continuing to not work great. Um, and so we think about things like, you know, students who were overwhelmed by the amount of emails that a campus sends, right? Now they're getting, you know, sometimes double that amount because they don't have the opportunity to stop into a professor's office, as you've said, um, and have that in-person conversation or, you know, with a registrar or an advisor. And so now they're managing all of the day-to-day um, -day workings of the institution in order to maintain enrollment, but also, as you mentioned, engagement. Um, so, you know, in, in some ways things haven't changed, but, you know, students who have caregiving responsibilities, um, you know, are still having those caregiving responsibilities. Um, and, you know, maybe those who weren't as engaged because of those responsibilities um, are still not able to engage in, in virtual ways. But I will say one hopeful thing, and that is that we have heard from some of our members that 
due to the online environment, what we have found is that students who maybe weren't engaged previously um, have been able to attend student group meetings. And so um, because they're now being offered virtually. And so I think the, the hopeful thing that I would say that I've heard from my colleagues is that that this transition to online has opened up opportunities for engagement for some students who do the you know late night transportation issues to attending you know um, student club organization meetings late at night or child care issues or job hours um, that the ability to attend those to attend those via zoom and to make those connections you know you can make an argument about whether or not those are as meaningful as they are in person but that the opportunity to participate i think has opened up in some ways in the virtual environment for students um, who maybe previously had not been able to participate. So I think that's one hopeful takeaway that we've heard. Uh, thank you very much, Jill. Um, interesting to think about, um, you know, and, and, and as we're thinking about all the challenges, right, that, that have uh, risen um, as a result of this, uh, there are some moments of opportunity for engagement, even if maybe they uh, weren't the kind of engagement or venues for engagement that people would have been thinking of in on the first day of March this year. Um, okay, so we'll come to Ken, uh, Ken now. Um, uh, uh, anyone I've talked to who has any kind of job on any college campus since mid-March is uh, concerned about their institution's uh, finances, um, their financial picture, uh, no matter how rich or not rich your institution is, is certainly uh, cloudy at best for sure. Um, Ken, can you tell us um, what has struck you most um, in the last uh, few months about what you're hearing from surveys, uh, from polling um, that I know your uh, organization has been doing that um, can give us some sense of uh, the financial picture for higher education here uh, at the uh, end of June? Sure. Uh, <clears throat> Eric, I want to go back to the original premise of your question, uh, and that is, uh, why have uh, institutions uh, been uh, inundated suddenly with with uh, surveys? And I think you're getting a picture of, of why uh, the benefit of that of, of, of that survey effort among the, the our our four respective organizations and, and many others. Uh, we at Nakubo, um, obviously, we do a number of of annual uh, surveys on endowments, uh, tuition discounting, et cetera. Uh, but we quickly realized uh, with the changing landscape of, of COVID-19 that uh, we would have to pivot and do more of a series of, of, of polls as opposed to surveys. Uh, with our polls, we weren't necessarily worried about the representativeness of, of the uh, uh, samples that we collected, but we were worried about um, getting information to uh, institutions as quickly as possible that would be meaningful and would tell a story. And so over the last couple of months, uh, uh, since uh, April and into May and now June, we've done a, a grand total of nine of these polls, uh, looking at different aspects of institutional finance. And uh, probably, uh, I, I think for us, there's positive and negative, obviously. The, the positive has been how quickly institutions have been transitioning, have been able to transition successfully to uh, online learning. Uh, we found nearly all the schools that uh, we surveyed uh, made that pivot within a two week period, which from a, a educational standpoint, I think is, is, is really good. Um, uh, what we don't know yet, and I think uh, what we'll need to find out as time goes on is, is perceived or actual quality of that instruction uh, relative to traditional uh, campus-based learning, but certainly, um, the, the pivot toward uh, that uh, uh, ha, has been uh, a speedy and, and I think uh, successful to the standpoint of making that transition. Uh, but uh, the concerns, as some of you alluded to, we, we know that a good number of the people, uh, the institutes that respond to our surveys on liquidity um, and concerns about uh, uh, cash on hand and where they were going to get the, uh, the funds to pay for those uh, expenses. Um, is a big concern, particularly among the smaller uh, private institutions. Uh, and uh, uh, secondly, I'm sure the regional publics would say this as well, that uh, it has been very expensive. Uh, 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 we uh, uh, know that more than a quarter of the institutions that responded to our survey said they spent an additional $50,000 or more making that transition. Uh, where do you find those funds uh, when money was already tight. Uh, so uh, 
Uh, but in, in, in general, I think our polls, uh, which I know we'll, we'll talk more about uh, the survey strategy and other things later, so I won't go too much into this, but, but in general, I think our, what our polls have done is really painted a picture of what institutions are doing on the financial aspect to try to meet the needs of their students um, in a very resource constrained environment and in an environment where obviously the the first concern is, of course, the, the health and well-being of, 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 of students and faculty uh, as uh, uh, they left campus and then hopefully uh, at some point we we'll return to campus. Sorry, Ken, I'm going to stick with you for uh, a minute, if, if I may. Um, you know, I, I was talking with uh, an enrollment manager, uh, vice president for enrollment at a, a small uh, resource constrained uh, college on the Mid-Atlantic last week. and. And um, he, he, he views um, uh, the, the avalanche of data, uh, survey data that he's um, uh, uh, buried in, he views it favorably. So this is national survey data and also institution specific survey data. They're surveying the hell, as he said, uh, uh, out, of, out of their um, returning or hopefully returning uh, students. So, but he said, you know, I gotta admit, I'm supposed to sound smart here, Eric, but he said, um, I've, I've, I've got all this data, but I'm not, I'm not sure what, to, what exactly to do with it. And uh, uh, or there's disagreement perhaps on his campus about what to, what to do. And I, and I feel like that's a, that's a major question. You can look at a data set and think, well, these are interesting findings. These are uh, revealing in some way. Uh, okay, uh, what, what kind of action do we take? How do we translate um, those uh, polling or survey findings into practice? You mentioned um, you know, a couple of things that institutions may be doing. I just wonder, um, Ken, I'll start with you and then others, please chime in. Um, uh, what, what, what might be some meaningful examples, even small examples of institutions taking um, survey findings or student poll findings or just kind of institutional norming uh, data findings and, and then doing something new or doing something different or making an adjustment right now? What do those kinds of things look like? Well, I, I think you're right. Um, it's where, you know, we haven't seen a pandemic like this in 100 years. So uh, trying to design uh, uh, strategies of what to do next, uh, it's going to be hard for anybody, uh, regardless of how much data they may have available. But I, I think there's some clues, at least from our surveys, as to what institutions are trying to do. Um, we did a survey, for example, on uh, institutional uh, use of, the care, of their CARES Act funds. Um, and the one piece of information that we, I thought was very revealing about what institutions have been doing or are probably going to try to do in the future is that well over half of the schools that uh, said that they had gotten their funds for CARES Act uh, uh, federal grants for students were also uh, very aggressively fundraising for additional funds on top of their federal funds to also provide aid for students. To, to me, that, that points to the fact that institutions understand that the situation they're in is going to uh, uh, require a lot more, uh, not just ag aggressive fundraising strategies, but strategies that are geared toward uh, mitigating the effects of, of what's going on to, to uh, uh, help students. Uh, so to me, that's uh, uh, an action um, that I think many campuses are, are, are clearly taking and probably will take in the future, uh, going away from what uh, uh, had in the past maybe uh, looking for endowed funds and now looking for more toward unrestricted or immediate use funds uh, to help students. Uh, second uh, thing I think uh, I should mention is uh, the, the, uh, um, in a lot of ways, because campuses don't quite know what to do next is sort of this uh, wait and see or, or um, sort of stable approach like, like for example, we did a, a survey recently on uh, en endowments. And the one thing that we found uh, revealing is that most schools said that despite the losses they've taken their endowments, they're gonna keep their spending steady in part because they're not quite sure when the next shoe might fall or if the markets might uh, suddenly turn positive and um, understanding the long-term nature of, of those kinds of funds. So, um, uh, so I, I guess for us, it's been a little bit of a mi mixture, but in general, I, I, I agree with the premise of your question. Um, um, at least from a financial standpoint, uh, many schools are, are, are kind of saying, well, we know we have these issues, and we know we can deal with them in some ways by fundraising, but in other ways, uh, we just have to see how things play out before we can really 
uh, definitively take one action versus another. Thank you, Ken. I hear that. Um, Jill, I, I wonder um, if uh, what might strike you as um, uh, a couple of meaningful ways that um, institutions have been trying kind of to capture data in the moment and then act on um, those findings, what they're hearing from students. I'm, I'm really fascinated by um, the, the notion that um, students may be chiming in um, more so, right, in response to surveys than, than they have in the past. I know that's often a challenge for campuses um, in kind of in normal times, but um, maybe some ways that um, colleges have pivoted or adjusted um, uh, on the fly, it would almost have to be on the fly during a, a spring of upheaval um, based on what they were hearing from their students that they polled. Absolutely. I think, again, I might echo um, some of the things that Ken said, especially with regard to emergency aid. Um, NASPA has, you know, had a, um, a focus on that for a few years now and uh, recently, within the past couple of years, issued a report on emergency aid. Um, who was doing it? How were they doing it? How were students finding out that emergency aid existed? Um, and so um, we have a, an entire website um, devoted to that. But it um, it, it's it's inter it's been interesting because you know with the influx of CARES money it's it's been sort of um, a spotlight on those processes and so the students uh, the campuses that had really well developed um, emergency aid you know protocols and processes I think were better served when this money came through because their students had places that they know that they could access that aid for support um, and previous to COVID right like these were things like you know my my car broke down and I need you know a short term loan to be able to get to campus and back um, and so this you know the the need may look very different under the CARES funding um, and the students, you know, facing different crises as a result of COVID. But um, the processes, I think, that were in place prior to that were really, as I said, you know, the institutions, I think, were really well served in doing that. Um, we're hearing from our members, again, um, just that they, when we surveyed them, that one of the things that they want to focus on in the, you know, next two to three months is how to engage students in a meaningful way in a virtual environment, knowing that, you know, some uh, you know, fall semesters or quarters may be cut short if there's another outbreak or that they're starting early and then may have to leave early. Um, and so how are we ensuring that community uh, feel that we, you know, bill our campuses as in the virtual environment? I think um, for me, one of the real opportunities here, though, is that I think faculty are also trying to ascertain that, right? So how do we engage students meaningfully, recreate those sort of classroom community dynamics? And so I think there's a real opportunity here for both student affairs professionals and academic affairs to really share data on what they are hearing from students so that we can reduce the over-surveying, right? Um, or even using, you know, course evaluations to hear what students really enjoyed um, in, as far as an online environment. I don't think all the news is bad in that regard, but um, how can student affairs professionals learn from what faculty have heard about what worked well in their classes and use that for student organizations, civic engagement, other types of um, service learning um, in a remote and virtual environment. Um, and then finally, I'll just say, I think um, one of the pivots I see long term is that this has really highlighted um, the, the different, uh, the sort of back burner status that online students get. Um, and so I think in the future, what we'll do is, is we'll find ourselves in a much better position to serve online students um, in terms of engagement, making sure that they have access to opportunities um, and internships and, and all of the ways that we regularly engage with our on-campus students um, in the in the virtual world for those who never come to a campus. So I, I have hope for that, um, that, that, the, that that population of students will be better served in the long term based on what we're learning now. Thank you very much, Jill. Um, uh, Christina, I want to turn to you. So I know you have this uh, kind of trove of uh, data coming out uh, tomorrow, right? Um, uh, in, a, in a very robust uh, report and, and um, and I found it very interesting to read. And, and so I'm thinking, though, um, that data is going to arrive as, as colleges have um, been trying for months to act on other findings. Um, from your perspective, what are some meaningful ways that existing data or data uh, that your organization is going to drop uh, on, the, on the world tomorrow, on the world of higher ed tomorrow? Um, uh, what, where does that fit in in terms of uh, colleges trying to uh, take findings um, such as those in uh, your organization's uh, report and uh, do something with them that might help students in some large or small ways, perhaps? Yeah, so first I'll, I'll, I'll just speak to some of the ways that institutions that we've partnered with to field those surveys have already taken action on the findings. And then I'll say just um, a word or two about what we what we hope folks will will take away from the report tomorrow. So, um, 
our survey implementation process this past semester has been unlike what it looks like any other semester. We developed a brand new set of surveys in a matter of weeks. Uh, we only left surveys in the field for two weeks at a time. Uh, institutions that we partner with have access to those results immediately upon when they're coming in. It just, it's, it's not typically the way that we do things, but it was, um, it was needed and will actually probably end up um, changing some of the ways that we, we do our survey work going forward. Um, there are two main ways that I, I would say institutions have um, used the findings so far. Um, the primary one has been to help um, shape outreach to, to students because they're getting all of these data back in real time. They're able to um, connect with with students when they leave their contact information to share more information, let's say, about about financial aid, academic advising, the kinds of support services that students are really looking to hear more from um, at this point. There's I mean, we've all been speaking about it, but just a tremendous amount of uncertainty about financial and academic standing going going into the fall. Um, and one of the, I guess I'll just give away something that's in the report tomorrow, but um, you know, we're, we're not seeing the kind of relationship that we would like to see between um, indicators of students having the greatest need and being aware of those emergency resources, Jill, that, you're, that you were talking about. Um, you would hope that students who have the greatest need are the most aware of, of, of those resources. And unfortunately, that's not the kind of kind of relationship. So doing doing that kind of direct student outreach is, is really important. Um, the other way that, that institutions have been able to use the, the survey findings is to, to pull some open ended uh, comments, pair them with some of the aggregate results and, and use that as um, as a, a few different types of types of data for for fundraising that's the other that's the other way that we've heard institutions using the results and again been able to use them in in real time while the surveys are still still in the field um eric to your to your question about um what we hope institutions take take away from the aggregate findings across 21 institutions that we're going to release tomorrow. Um, I'm thinking, David, back to what you were saying before about how different each each school is, and I think that's particularly true around the extent to which um, they are financially dependent on tuition. For for example, like the the decisions that need to be made um, that have financial implications for what the funding model looks like for a, for a certain institution is, is certainly true. But I will say that there, there are even across four year colleges and two year colleges, there are a number of themes that are really, really similar. So I know, um, institutions that we work with, um, for good reason are often looking, um, looking for benchmark stats against other institutions. Um, and there are certainly areas where where institutions deviate from one another um, most often because of what the the demographics of their student body look like more than anything else based on the kinds of questions we are asking um, but there there is a lot of a lot of overlap so um, i would hope that institutions that see this report tomorrow think okay maybe there's maybe there's some some things here that don't resonate with what i've heard from my students maybe we need to go field one of these surveys in the fall to to dig into that further but i i hope that they would take the results uh seriously as probably representing the experience of some set of their students if not if not the entire student body thank you christine um for that uh david i'll turn to you so okay so college is very um, by size and selectivity and wealth, but um, if I'm an enrollment manager at any of them, I probably have more gray hair or less hair um, and more sleepless nights than ever before. Um, whether it's um, maybe a set of findings from your student poll, uh, uh, getting at some national uh, picture of where students and families are, um, or um, drawn from your work with individual institutions. I wonder what might come to mind as um, an action or a reaction um, that institutions um, uh, are taking um, to their sense of this new reality that strike you as meaningful or uh, possibly instructive in some way, or just interesting. Uh, um, uh, how, are, how are colleges adjusting? What, what, are, what are the changes in actions or strategy uh, on the enrollment side that strike you as um, particularly meaningful right now? 
Eric, I, I couldn't help uh, seeing your wince uh, on your second or third sentence there. Um, those of you who don't, who might have missed a chroni uh, chronicle uh, uh, article that Eric wrote three, four, five years ago called The Hottest Seat on Campus, uh, that being the seat of the enrollment manager. And um, yeah, no, no doubt it's become hotter in this, in this hotter still in, in this era. Though I think there are a whole lot of hot seats and a whole lot of people uh, scrambling to, to do the best they can. Um, I, I would break this up into two parts, and I, uh, the answer to my question, Eric, and, and one of them I will start and then probably table till later in our discussion. And that is the relationship between what's going on right now and how institutions are dealing with it right now, and what the relationship between what the relationship is between that and the long-term strategic thinking, planning, and action in which institutions need to engage and the data they need to be able to make the decisions that will carry them forward. There's a, there's a relationship between these things, and, and I would like to come back to that, that point later on. Suffice to say, it's not the same thing to say that we're gonna do a bunch of stuff online and that is our future salvation. Well, actually it may be a piece of something you do or how you operate. It may have nothing to do with the, uh, with the necessary and sufficient test of what it takes to thrive over the long run. Come back to that. In the short run, um, we see institutions acting from an enrollment management point of view from different ways, but also fundamentally in academic affairs as Jill and others have noted. And in, student, and in student life in all kinds of important ways. What do you do when you run a study using very highly sophisticated modeling methods that are not just traditional pick A, B, C, or D kind of polling? What do you do when you get a response that says the single thing that's gonna drive students not to come back is the fact that they are going to miss community and social life? And if you're, if you're delivering online, then you need to do some real serious thinking to go back to a point Jill made earlier about how you build community and how you take social kinds of things that students are dreaming of, have experienced, or are we're looking forward to experience that they suddenly go away and you have to find them in new ones. Those are fundamental substantive things that institutions are engaged in in the short term. Enrollment managers, uh, excuse me, in, in, in academic affairs, um, we've done studies where we're looking at what happens if we if we plow bunches of money uh, into making individual courses really sing online and using all the interactive and other techniques that are available in online learning, as opposed to doing what most institutions did this past spring, which was slap you onto Zoom and try to do your best to replicate what's happening in a normal classroom. Should we invest what is for some institutions millions of dollars in intensive months in doing that or not? Uh, in enrollment management, there are questions about how you create virtual tours and how you build relationships with people that, are, that have not been done in the modalities that, that are now being forced on these institutions. We find that the last piece of this that at least our research has been pointing to direct action on is price and aid. And a lot of that is, is driven by the mission-informed um, motivations that several of our colleagues on the panel have been talking about today. But some of these institutions are finding that they're, being, they're struggling between how do I serve students whose need is rising and, and, and from the point of view of an institution whose revenue is shrinking, in some cases dramatically. I mean, we, I, we, we've done studies this, you know, in very recent times, these flash studies I was talking about from individual institutions where a modeling suggests if they have to be online, some of these institutions could lose 40, 50, 60% of their students. Others, not, not bad at all. But what happens when you try to balance these things? So um, in, in, in a, we, we work in a sector that advances and disseminates knowledge. We work in a sector where strategy level decision-making is often, <laughs> from the hip and not from the data. Um, and that, that tension is a, is a real one, but we're finding that the data are informing decisions across fundamentals, as I was describing them in student life and academic life and enrollment management and the fundamentals of what we charge 
and how we generate revenue, even in this immediate context. Um, thank you, David. Uh, I'm, I, don't, I don't know how some of these folks on college campuses sleep. Um, uh, it's a, it's a, it's a, an incredible time to be running a, um, an institution. Um, I want to just quickly uh, uh, flag a, an article today um, that was in the Chronicle by my awesome colleague Allison Berg, and she was writing um, a news story about a survey done at another survey uh, at Arizona State University. Um, and part of the headline is low-income students are disproportionately hit by the pandemic. Um, echoing uh, some thoughts that all of you have shared. Um, and I, I was just struck by this wording that she used. Um, uh, this, this survey of students at ASU found that students were, quote, uh, had, uh, quote, suffered noticeably, but unequally. Um, and just a reminder, yet another reminder that, um, that uh, just as institutions are affected in different ways, um, depending on your socioeconomic status, the luck of birth, um, you as a college student um, might be more or less affected by the pandemic and the disruption, the economic challenges that have arisen. And so just, I mean, obviously we know that, but I, I don't think it can be discussed enough. And I, and I wonder if that um, thought about um, students who are the most vulnerable being smacked kind of the hardest by circumstances right now relates to our conversation about surveying and how we do it and what are the ethical considerations of surveying and polling students, particularly students who are vulnerable and might have the most need um, right now. Um, um, you know, what, what, what do we need to keep in, in mind about um, students, particularly those, um, if there are enrollment people writing me saying that they are experiencing survey fatigue, that is, they're just on the receiving end of the findings of the surveys and polls of students, uh, then, then it, it must follow that there are students um, uh, out there who, who are in some way um, dealing with survey fatigue themselves, perhaps. And I wondered, um, particularly as we're thinking about the fall arriving fast and colleges wanting to uh, check in with their students and survey them and pull them about their needs, about their wellness, about their challenges. It's got to follow that there are better and worse ways of going about that. And uh, Christine, I wonder if you might talk to us about kind of the ethical, um, humane dimensions of surveying. Thanks, Eric. It's it's a really a really important topic. Um, you know, we've my team has given a lot of thought to to. What can people handle right now under crisis? What, ha what are they able to handle over the last couple of months? Um, what are we willing to send out um, that potentially is going to burden a community at a time when they don't need another, another thing on their plate? Um, and so uh, maybe, maybe when I'm wrapped up what I'm about to say, I'll drop a link to this uh, into the chat. I wrote up um, a piece about a, a month ago, feels like years ago, um, uh, a couple about a couple of strategies for humanely fielding surveys right now during during a global crisis and um, the first the first of the five strategies is just maybe you shouldn't field a survey at all which is you know uh, kind of a funny way to to start out the piece um, Jill I think maybe you mentioned earlier about you know working across student affairs and academic affairs so so consulting data that you already have on hand um that you know maybe it was collected pre-pandemic but as we've all been saying uh there there are issues that did exist before the pandemic that we can reasonably assume have have just been been amplified now um what efforts are worth foregoing altogether if are you conducting a survey or a poll right now that isn't about the pandemic maybe maybe you should postpone those efforts um your your data are going to be tainted in some way in some way anyway um, that's the kind of the the headline that I would want to get across about what's what's guided some of our thinking. Um, we've also just really focused on how easy we can make it to participate in these in these surveys. Every time I'm reviewing a draft, I'm thinking, how can I cut two or three questions out of here? What's what's non-essential? How short can we make this? Um, how quickly can we can we field the results back into back into action? Um, are there any questions here that are uh, 
interesting or or nice to know we don't really have the the luxury right now of asking those kinds of kinds of questions it would be um, irresponsible to do so so those are some of the some of the guiding principles that have um, influenced the way that we've we've worked with institutions over the past couple of months thank you Christine um, um, uh, I, I had this question and someone raise your hand whoever wants to take can can uh, uh, what can, can we overreact to survey findings as uh, we, meaning institutions, right, of, of, of higher ed? Um, I mean, I, th I think just as sometimes people are overwhelmed by like, well, I've got all this data and I'm not sure what to do, right, um, if anything, um, um, what to start doing or start doing differently. But like, um, uh, could, 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 a, could a college uh, or university overreact um, or overadjust to um, a survey finding? David. Um, I think institutions can and they have. Um, there is, uh, there are uh, so some of the things I would add from an ethical point to, excuse me, add to the ethical point of view that Christine was talking about earlier. Um, there are practical considerations in all of this. Um, I, I have, I, I alluded to this earlier, but I have found that we've spoken with leaders of institutions who see the current circumstances and see some data on what the current circumstances present to them and start to think of that as their long-term futures. Okay, this is what we are, we now are. No, this is what we are in the midst of this crisis. And it is, it, and I, I, I've counseled a lot of leaders to be really careful that some of what you might do and it might invest in now and might, um, Put at the center of, of the lives of your uh, of your faculty, your staff, your administrator, your students, um, are things that are relevant now, but it may either be insufficient over the long run or actually take you in the wrong direction in the long run. Um, there, we find ourselves counseling uh, leaders to think uh, along three time horizons: the now, the stuff that's on the tip of your nose, the stuff you have to deal with right now, and then the stuff that's looks a ways out, but is actually only two or three inches in front of your nose. How do you create a revenue stream? How do you, not just how do you operate, how do you make sure that students are being exposed to things online, that you're building some kind of student life online, but how you're thinking about your revenue stream is gonna be and what you need to get to it, those kinds of practical considerations. And then the third, the third uh, horizon is the following. This crisis will eventually ease, if not lift, and the world we will function in when it lifts will not be any easier than it was when we were hit. It'll be more difficult still than we were thinking it was going to be going ahead. And the institutions that find themselves focused singly on dealing with the crisis are going to wake up to a harder reality. For institutions that are well healed and high stature and selective, and raising bundles, it'll be harder than it used to be to do those things. It won't be impossible, it'll be harder. But for most institutions, these are going to become questions of real difficulty and real challenge, and for many of them, they'll be existential challenges. So we find ourselves counseling a lot. Okay, focus on the now, you've got to. And you better look far, far enough ahead of your nose to be able to see how you're going to generate an experience, and if you will, a market. Um, looking not so far ahead to the fall and the following spring, but you better carve out a piece of space for figuring out what you're going to do strategically moving forward. You're going to find yourselves coming out of one crisis and into a more prolonged one. Okay, thank you, David. Um, because it's a lot to, that's a lot to think about. Um, uh, it's each day seems to be its own kind of uh, uncertain puzzle. Um, but, it, but I think there's uh, wisdom there in, in what you say. Um, we are at 114 and I know we're getting some really good questions. Um, so I wanna get to some of them for sure. So I, I think we should uh, transition um, into hearing um, from some of the folks who are writing in with um, uh, sharp questions uh, now. And um, uh, we'll uh, start with a question that uh, should go to uh, Rachel and Sophie from New America. Um, and uh, someone asked, does the report um, tell how many uh, Democrats, Republicans, 
attended uh, and their children attended a public or private um, college? So we don't have that data, um, but we do ask a battery of questions every year about how people feel about certain sectors of higher education. So how do you feel about the public community college sector, public four-year, private nonprofit uh, institution, and then private for-profit institutions. Um, so you can look at how people, uh, how Democrats and Republicans feel about these institutions. Um, we ask like, you know, are they for people like me? Are they using their money wisely? Do they run efficiently? Um, do they help build America's workforce? Questions like that. Um, there's actually quite a bit of alignment between Democrats and Republicans. Democrats um, tend to feel more positively about um, pretty much all sectors of education until about the for-profit sector, and that's when a lot of positivity sort of dies off. Um, both Democrats and Republicans do not feel uh, that positive about for-profit education. Um, interestingly, in the four years that we've uh, done work in with this a battery of questions about different sectors of institutions. Public community colleges are always kind of like the darling of the higher education sectors where they're always viewed uh, sort of the most positively overall, um, followed by public four-year schools, then followed by um, uh, nonprofits, and then in how people for profit for the few years. And I think that's most likely because we've seen a, a large for-profit closures and, and um, uh, we're struggling institutions um, stemming from the last recession. Okay, thank you, Rachel, um, for that. Uh, next question, uh, let's see here, um, comes from Helena. Uh, Helena asks a question that reminds me in my first uh, editor uh, told me that sometimes the best questions to ask as a reporter are short and kind of big. Um, so in that spirit, I'll relay Helena's question and uh, someone please raise, raise their hand to, to answer this one. Uh, what makes a good survey? Anyone? David. I'll take a shot at not answering that question, uh, <laughs> which is fundamentally it depends what you're trying to find out about whom for what purpose. And there are, there are kinds of things we need to understand that we need to understand in a very broad way. Uh, there are things that Ken was referring to some earlier where we don't really need to understand exactly the full census of the full population we're trying to understand, but we need to have a read on something. Um, and, you know, those things can be good, they can be useful, they can also be useless. When a television station shows you its real-time poll, of course, among those who felt like responding, who are watching their shows, that's kind of silly stuff. There are other questions that require enormous amounts of, of precision. You're trying to call a, uh, an election. And the election could be won by something under a tenth of a percent. Well, you'd better have a really large sample so that you can narrow your, your, your potential margin of error. There are others. Most of the work we do is about institutional strategy. You're not going to change the nature of academic life at an institution because 1% of the people think this or 2%. You're going to change. You're going to, you might change it if 10 or 20 or 40 do. So there, there, are, there are questions around sample size that relate to that, and there are, samples around, there are questions around methodology. Um, there are certain things where you can ask people and you get an honest answer. If you ask a young person, why are you choosing institution A over institution B, and you ask it outright and you take that answer as gospel, uh, then you don't have a lot of faith because um, you're not getting a real answer. So I, my non-answer to the question is it all depends what you're trying to find out about whom. That's, I mean, that's exact. that is the right answer. I know, David, you're saying that's not the, not the answer to the question. It is, I think that is the, maybe one of the only, only ways to answer a question that's that big. I'll also just add, um, one of the, one of the things that we've been trying to be just really, um, 
asking our partner institutions as we're crafting these new surveys is are you prepared to act on the on the results from this from this question are you are you presenting a false promise by asking you know if, if you're an organization and you're you're surveying your staff um, and you want to ask people about their is is their home setup uh, you know ergonomically friendly are you prepared to take those results and uh, and act on them. What are what are you willing to provide staff as far as their um, their equipment and their and their home setup? Um, so um, I think the the surveys are useful not only for for gathering data but also communicating about what's important to you and what you're willing to do with the findings. And if you are certain that there's something that you can't actually act on, there's it's you know beyond all all possibility. Um, maybe maybe just don't don't bother asking about it until you know how you might you might move that forward. Uh, thank you, Christine, for that good thought on what to include in a survey and why. Um, being clear on on the why uh, seems like uh, um, good advice um, if you're going to trouble students with a, a question. Um, I uh, wanted to get to a question from Laura, and I'm going to send this one your way, Ken if that's all right. Um, Laura asks, regarding university strategic planning, what are your thoughts regarding layoffs, furloughs, et cetera, for staff and faculty positions? Uh, do you anticipate a shrinking of administrative sh uh, staff in the short term and potentially long term, given the concerns regarding financing of a degree? Um, and, and certainly others, David in particular uh, could should chime in as well. Um, <clears throat> I'll give a response uh, based on clearly on what we know now uh, as far as our surveys. But but um, as David said, there is the, there is the other side to this um, uh, because at some point the the uh, the pandemic will end and institutions will have to deal with staffing issues long before long after that. Um, uh, so with that in mind, uh, the short answer is uh, we already know uh, that a number of institutions have publicly already announced various uh, uh, strategies in terms of uh, uh, layoffs, uh, furloughs, uh, reductions in employee benefits, those, those kinds of, of, of actions have already occurred. Um, we know from one of the surveys that we did that a uh, number of institutions have, have already either announced those plans or, or, or uh, as of the survey date, uh, we're considering that those plans, um, again, varying uh, by size of institution. Um, I guess the, 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 the sort of uh, the other side to, to, to this is I think what institutions will have to really be concerned about is not just making cuts, uh, uh, but <clears throat> but being very strategic in, in how uh, what is what is cut or what, and and then what is grown. I mean, because uh, uh, campuses have strengths. Uh, some campuses they may be stronger in their student affairs or or other types of, of uh, areas and want to preserve those and and. Uh, and uh, so I, I think that the tricky part to that question is not so much will it happen because it, it has and it will continue. It's uh, what do campuses do strategically beyond that? Uh, because as the, the Claude de Crisse, uh, you can't cut your way, your way to growth. Um, and certainly you can't cut your way to improvement. Um, so, uh, but yeah, I guess, as I said, the short answer to that question uh, is yes, uh, administrative expenses are being redu reduced at all campuses, at all types. Uh, and uh, uh, my guess is, uh, depending on how the fall enrollments go, they, they certainly will continue on uh, until we get to the end of, 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 of the current pandemic and probably for some institutions beyond that. All right, thank you, Ken. Um, I'm gonna quickly just uh, turn a question here into just a comment that I feel like um, I, should, I should note here from Megan. And she uh, writes, as a first uh, generation low-income student, I can attest to survey fatigue. Many are missing the role off-campus housing is playing in regard to uncertainty and the inability to sign a lease 
that we may not be able to get out of if we completely move online uh, in the fall? Um, that's definitely a crucial question. Um, housing um, and housing contracts um, that, that will affect many students uh, no matter what happens um, in the coming months. Um, so a question for our um, panelists here um, that I'd like to just throw out to, again, whoever might raise his or her hand first. Um, as New America starts preparing the survey questionnaire for next year, what would the panelists like to know or what would be helpful to learn about Americans' beliefs in higher education next year? I guess I'll start and I'm sure others will chime in. Um, uh, going back to uh, uh, this transition to online learning, um, I guess the, the, the one piece that I think really needs to be emphasized, uh, we know, and I certainly going forward, people will still have support higher education writ large, um, but will they support um, online environments versus on-campus environments? Back to the, the, the comment that Eric just read, I think that it's clear to me that when people think of college, they think the traditional ivy covered buildings and dining halls and, and those kinds of things. Um, we know for sure that that didn't happen for, for a half of this uh, academic year, and it may not happen for the beginning part, at least of next academic year. Um, does that change your perception? Um, or is college just about the learning and the modality of learning doesn't really matter and, and people like college, even if it's online uh, uh, compared to the other thing. So I think teasing that out um, to me would be the next uh, pot potential iteration of uh, the next uh, at varying by degrees. I'll just, I'll, I'll throw it, throw something in. Um, I mean, I think uh, as a lot of students, um, especially those that maybe, maybe live with their families or thinking about what they're going to do this fall, um, you know, I, I suspect that some large, large portion will be staying closer to home, not going away, um, either taking classes online through the institution that they, that they intended to, to enroll in in the fall. Um, or perhaps with a local community college, and I, I, I'll be really interested. I, I, I don't know if um, you know the survey gets into the differences between perceptions around two-year colleges versus four-year colleges. Um, given the extent to which um, two-year colleges tend to do a little bit more and maybe be a little bit more prepared for the online instruction, um, I'd be, I'd be interested to see if, if that, um, if that yields anything. I mean, I think it's, it's amazing. Uh, in some ways, I, I mean, I can I can relate to the position that you all are in with having collected these data. When you did, we uh, we did this huge survey of academic library leaders right before the pandemic and had to completely reframe how we talked about what the results represented. But it's it's such a gift to have this baseline. So any kind of longitudinal um, analysis that you can conduct um, will be will be incredible. Just given when when the data collection occurred. I would add kind of a meta point, I can tell me if it's way off base, I apologize if it is. But uh, picking up on Christine's earlier point about making sure that research you do actually leads to actions so that you, it's been worth people participating it from an ethical and a fatigue point of view. The work that we do is all about how we affect change, how we, how we, how we work to change the, the decisions that people make of various kinds, whether to apply, attend, give, hire. We're, we're looking at trying to change a behavior in a, in a constituency. And I wonder if, as you look at a question, that questions around general American adults' perceptions around higher ed, whether there is an action you'd like to affect in it. Um, and what that might cause you to focus in on in terms of questions or what it might cause you to focus in on in terms of the modeling one might do. It's a little harder to do it post hoc, but especially sitting here in 2020, 
just itching to know not only what do people think, but whether these things would affect their voting behaviors come November. Um, so I, 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 that's a broad point, but I think something that may be worth considering. Thank you. Let's see, we are almost at uh, 1.30, and yep. I wanted to thank everyone for all these uh, great thoughts and great questions from outside of our uh, panel today. So thank you, Rachel, I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, thanks everyone. This is, I was, you probably saw me like shifting out of screen as I actually took my old fashioned pen and took it to paper because we're thinking about what the next year is going to bring and, um, and we edit this every year. And so it seems like a great opportunity and time to, to get people's thoughts on what we should ask. Um, we usually field this in December, January, um, and that's going to be a rock, rocky time, right? No matter if we do it December or in January, we'll have just experienced an election and um, all these thoughts go into like when you field um, surveys and how you're asking questions. Um, so this was, this was a great help. I want to thank everybody for participating today. Uh, and we hope to see you really soon in the future. Um, thanks, thanks to Eric and, and all the panelists.